You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Lovecast, www.savagelovecast.com. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Lovecast. Remember HB2 in North Carolina? It is the anti trans bathroom bill and it's been getting a ton of press all over the country it's really dominated the national conversation for weeks for months now it's been all trump and all where do trans people get to pee in north carolina and to that point i hope you all caught and if you didn't catch you're about to catch chris matthews interview on friday night last friday night with travis Weber. He is an anti-LGBT spokes bigot for the Family Research Council, and he was invited on Hardball on MSNBC with Chris Matthews and with Jennifer Boylan, who is a prof at Yale and a writer and contributes op-ed pieces to the New York Times and also a cast member of I Am Kate on E! Uh, and a trans woman herself. And there was this amazing exchange that went on and on and on with Chris Matthews asking this question repeatedly of Travis Weber from FRC. Travis, tell Jenny what bathroom she should use. Well, you know, I'm not what's sure. wrong with should she use? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. Um, well, well, just answer that question. I think I think people. She said she would she would not be comfortable or not cause a problem if she walked into a men's room. Should she walk into a men's room? I think we can do things the way we've done them for decades, and people could use bathrooms according to biological sex. All right, I'm going to break in here for just a second. What we've actually done for decades, what we've done forever before state legislators like those in North Carolina began to attempt to regulate this, is allow trans people to use the bathroom of their choice. The law this twerp from FRC is on TV defending ends what we've been doing for decades, what we've been doing forever, and makes it a crime for trans people to use the appropriate bathroom. All right, let's jump back into this interview. People, what should a transgender person who identifies as a woman do? What bathroom should they go to? Just keep it simple. Yeah, well, well there's an issue of so privacy. You can ask the question. Okay. Privacy what concerns. What should they do? All right, jumping in really quickly. He still won't answer the question. What should they do? He ducks it. He dodges. What should Jenny do if she was living or visiting North Carolina right now? Should she go to the, to the men's room? Well, it, it, she, I mean, it's the question. You're dodging the toughest question, yeah, which is, actually, what do you want it, people yeah. to behave like? It, it's, with not the fact matter, that, it's not a matter of what I want. Spoiler, it's, still won't answer the question. Should Jenny go to the men's room or the ladies' room? Well, she can use an accommodation bathroom that's, that is a, that's a single-use bathroom that would protect the privacy interests of the students on the other side. Here's what happened. Travis Weber, having to sit face-to-face with an actual trans person, having a trans person on television alongside him, able to respond to him personally, immediately, in real time, lacked the courage of his own bigoted convictions. Because the law that he's on TV defending, HB2, requires Jenny Boylan, a woman, to use a men's room in North Carolina, period, full stop. Yet it is a crime for Jenny Boylan to use the women's room in North Carolina. But Travis couldn't look Jenny in the virtual eye. They weren't in the same studio. They were on a satellite link. Couldn't look her in the virtual eye and say that because he knows it's a losing argument. Just like the religious right eventually came to realize that all their arguments against same-sex marriage were losing arguments. A few weeks ago, I wrote a post in which I predicted that they would lose. The religious right, the haters would lose on trans people and bathrooms and trans rights, just as they lost on gay rights and same-sex marriage. They were telling ridiculous lies about same-sex marriage, and those lies in the aughts, in the 2000s, they won them some battles. They carried the day before the Washington State Supreme Court, where I live, but they didn't win them the war. Because those lies, the lies they were telling about same-sex couples, we want to destroy the family, that we were bad for kids, bad for communities, we're going to destroy the country, end the human race. That was one of the predictions they made, that if we allowed same-sex couples to marry, then the species would go extinct. Because if we allowed same-sex couples to marry, we would all instantly forget which whole shit's babies and forget how to make babies. Those were their arguments. And they couldn't survive us. They couldn't survive us getting out there, speaking for ourselves. They couldn't survive our lawyers. They couldn't survive satire and ridicule. And the anti-trans haters right now, they are winning some battles, like the passage of HB2 in North Carolina. But they are going to lose the war. 
because the lies they're telling about trans people can't survive trans people. They can't survive the facts about trans people. They can't survive trans people and their lawyers, who are many of them the same lawyers we had in the marriage equality fight, and they can't survive the scrutiny of fair-minded people like Chris Matthews on MSNBC who put it to this guy, who stuck it to this guy over and over and over again. Now, because it's important to hear not just about trans people, but from them, let's listen to something that Jenny Boylan had to say about HB2. Maybe the issue is really not bathrooms at all. Maybe they're tr because now gay men and lesbians can get married and they're no longer the whipping boys and whipping girls in this country. Now maybe they're trying to rile up people against transgender people. And it's not right and it's not fair. Boylan is absolutely correct. The minute marriage equality won at the Supreme Court, the minute the bigots and haters realized that it was over, they pivoted from demonizing and demagoguing about gay men and lesbians, about same-sex couples, to demagoguing about and demonizing trans people, trans men and women, particularly trans women. But it's important to note that HB2 doesn't just target trans people. They're not just trying to rile up people against transgender men and women. HB2 is a cover for all the same old hate. HB2 didn't just attempt to regulate and criminalize trans people and their lives. It also rolled back civil rights protections in cities in North Carolina for lesbian, gay, bi, and trans people. It prevents cities from raising the minimum wage. There's a whole campaign all across the country to raise the minimum wage in cities. Cities are leading the way. Seattle, Los Angeles, Chicago leading the way on this fight. HB2 preemptively prevents that kind of activism, that kind of campaign, that, that those efforts from ever coming to North Carolina. HB2 also makes it impossible for people who've been discriminated against in North Carolina on the basis of their race or their faith or their gender to sue in the states in North Carolina. So what you see here is really, let's imagine it's a, a Sunday and you've got a great big scoop of your chocolate hate and a great big scoop of your vanilla hate and your strawberry hate. You hate seeing poor people get raises. You hate seeing lesbian and gay and bi people not getting discriminated against. You hate seeing people who've been discriminated against on the basis of their race, their faith, or their sex being able to sue in your courts. They've illegalized all those things. They've blocked all those things, too. And then they've smothered all of that, their usual same old boring hate, in a thick layer of trans hate whipped cream. So we can't even see what's going on underneath. This is really a hate omnibus bill with a big trans cherry on top. And trans people are the primary target of this legislation, but we're not talking about all the other awful shitty things HB2 does to all sorts of other people that these right-wing Republican shitbags have hated all along. HB2 doesn't just target trans people. It also targets lesbians and gays. It targets people of minority faiths in North Carolina. It targets people of minority races in North Carolina. Peel back the top layer of HB2, the anti-trans crap, and you'll find all the same old festering right-wing Republican hatreds all on display, all there, all wiggling around in the fine print of HB2. HB2, an attack on trans men and women in North Carolina, also an attack on lesbians and gays and poor people working for the minimum wage and racial minorities and women and religious minorities. It's an omnibus hate bill. So if you've been sitting on the sidelines because you think this is just some trans bathroom silliness and it doesn't really involve you, it doesn't really impact you, it doesn't really concern you, read the whole bill. It concerns you too. They, the people who are after trans people, they're after the rest of us. They're after you too. All right, before we get to your calls, just one more point about HB2. In the final accounting, this is adding up to a net benefit for trans people, this attack, because it's leading to exchanges like this on television, because it's putting trans people at the center of a national debate. And when you're at the center of a national debate and the other side is lying about who you are and what you want and what you've done and what you mean, 
you will win that national debate. That is why we have marriage equality now, because we had a national debate where the other side was lying and demagoguing, and eventually people could see through the lies and see through the demagoguery, and we won. And people are seeing through the lies and demagoguery about trans men and women right now, thanks to North Carolina, thanks to the haters overplaying their hand. Thanks to the haters exposing themselves as liars and demagogues like Travis Weber did on MSNBC last Friday night. That's why you see polls now showing a majority of Americans support allowing trans people to use the bathrooms that are appropriate for their gender identities and opposing laws like North Carolina. We would have killed for poll numbers like that at this stage in the fight for marriage equality. And we are already there now in the fight for justice for trans people. I used to say this all the time in the fight for marriage equality, even when we lost big, Washington State Supreme Court, New York State Supreme Court, we lost big, people were devastated. I would say, and I said that, and I'm saying now, we are winning. Trans people are winning this fight. All right, coming up on today's show, author Jillian Keenan here to discuss her new book, Sex with Shakespeare, and one of our regular guest experts, Joan Price, here to talk with us again about senior sex. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Club W, the wine club that sends wine to your door. Get 20 bucks off your first order of four bottles or more by going to clubw.com slash savage. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. Try Squarespace at squarespace.com and enter offer code SAVAGE at checkout to get 10% off. That's squarespace.com, offer code SAVAGE. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by adamandeve.com. Get 50% off almost any item plus three free adult DVDs and free shipping. Just go to adamandeve.com and enter SAVAGE at checkout. Hi, Dan and the at-risk youth. I live in the greater Boston area. I am... um, 33. I've been married for over a decade and my husband and I have a great sex life. And we've always talked about opening our relationship. And um, every time we kind of get to the point where we might almost do that, he does something where I'm like, whoa, I, like, <laughs> like I'm the only person he's ever kissed, much less dated. And when he interacts with other women, like he'll show me his emails or his Craigslist app, I'm kind of like, you were displaying terrible judgment. And that makes me want to kind of roll back this whole open relationship thing. So he has a job where, like if it came out that he lives sort of an unusual lifestyle, that he's very kinky, that could really affect his career. So he thinks it's better to use an anonymous email account you know, maybe have some kind of affair out of town, use a fake name, et cetera. And I'm like, I don't think that in the age of the internet, there are any secrets and it makes more sense to find some kind of ongoing outside thing with somebody who also values discretion and knows that you're married and you don't have kids and you're unavailable, perhaps join the kink community locally. Uh, and, and he just doesn't feel like that's very possible for him. I, you know, I don't really know what to do because I, I really, I don't think I'd mind if he had sort of an ongoing, even just sex buddy relationship or, or greater than that relationship with somebody locally or like to go to events or something. But he, you know, he's a single guy. If he approaches it without me, cause I, I'm not as interested in that. I have my own things I like to do individually. So what do you think, Dan? Is it, is it displaying poor judgment for him to, you know, kind of post an egg Craigslist ad saying like, hey, are there any hot bitches who want to get together for a crazy fuck? I'm like, you have no idea who these people are, you know, and like, I'm interested in not getting an STD. <laughs> like, what, what, what are the uh, comparative risks? I appreciate that you're not interested in getting an STD, but a study published in the journal for sexual health in October of last year found that people in monogamous relationships were at the same risk for contracting a sexually transmitted infection or disease as people in open relationships because people get cheated on. So just because he's out there looking for hot bitches to do sleazy things with doesn't mean that those hot bitches that he wants to do sleazy things with are going to be unsafe, aren't going to be interested in protecting their own health or the health of their other partners. 
And so he'll hopefully use condoms with them and they'll want to use condoms with him and perhaps he'll limit himself. Also, you say it's about kink. Maybe some of the encounters he wishes to have aren't going to be about penetration or fluid exchange at all. And so they will be low risk for many most sexually transmitted infections, although the skin to skin thing is still going to be a concern for you. But if you guys are going to have an open relationship, as I have said on the podcast, you are kind of signing up for a higher level of risk for the skin to skin transmitted STIs, and you have to be comfortable with that. You can't be hand ringy babies about, say, HPV or some of the others. Anyway, moving on to the other risk your semi high profile partner is running in the town where you live, you know, an ongoing thing, just like a monogamous relationship, isn't necessarily safer study shows than an open relationship when it comes to STIs, an ongoing thing isn't necessarily going to be safer for him in the long run than a one-off, out-of-town, nearly anonymous encounter. What if he has a regular fuck buddy with whom he has an ongoing thing who catches a bad case of feelings for him, or he catches one for her, and then you insist that he end it, or he wants to end it because of her feelings for him, and then that person, his regular extra piece on the side, gets angry and outs him. That is also a risk. So you have to weigh the risks and rewards here. There's sexual fulfillment, which is a very, I think, important reward. People risk everything for that particular reward. And then there are the risks of being outed. There's the risks of people finding out. There's the risks of scandal and gossip in the community where you live. If it really is that threatening to his career, if he could really be destroyed by this, Perhaps he needs to look into another line of work. Perhaps you guys need to think about transferring to another town where there are more people and there's more anonymity at your disposal. That's what's so great about a big city like New York is there are so many goddamn people there that it's easier to disappear into a crowd, including a crowd at a kink event. There's also the option of professionals because one of the things you pay professionals for is their discretion. And most sex workers I know take that obligation extraordinarily seriously think of all the sex workers out there in this just in this country plying their trade think of all the politicians and celebrities that they have worked with and think of how rarely a sex worker outs anybody you had the dc madam who had the names had the drop on many many political figures who didn't out anybody threatened to didn't and in the end tragically killed herself because she didn't want to go to prison, was driven to suicide while the people that her sex workers, her employees serviced were not outed, except for David Vetter. And think about the only other outing I can think of is Ted Haggard, who was outed by Mike Jones, a sex worker who was appalled by his hypocrisy because Ted Haggard was a high profile religious bigot and stumping against and condemning gay people and gay sex and gay marriage while having gay sex and doing gay meth behind his wife's back with a sex worker, a male sex worker. Those are the only two instances I can think of off the top of my head. All right, there was Elliot Spitzer, too, who had to resign, but he wasn't outed by the sex worker. They were dragged out, him and the sex worker. That was exposed, but not by the sex worker. So sex workers, if you're really concerned about privacy, may be your best route. Because there are shitty people out there online. There are people hunting for photographs. There are people who take perverse delight in exposing others. And that's a risk you're running. But there are risks to never getting the shit that you want. There are risks to never achieving sexual fulfillment. There are risks that come bundled with frustration and repression and denial, which include acting out impulsively when an opportunity presents itself. If you have a structured way to get to what you want sexually, you're less likely to lunge at what you want sexually if circumstances align in a way that's riskier. But people will do that. People will try to wall themselves off from what they want and then what they want will walk into the room and they will throw themselves at it, not realizing that they're being filmed or whatever else the risks are. Without realizing the risks that inherent in that kind of lunge are greater than something more methodical and planned. And I think people are likely to do the lunge if they aren't on the methodical and planned route to the shit they want, to sexual fulfillment. I guess this is just a roundabout way of saying there ain't no risk-free nothing when it comes to sex. There's risks in not acting on this shit. There's risks in acting on this shit. There are risks in a monogamous commitment, risks in an open relationship, risks in hiring a professional. I think there are less than risks in trawling Craigslist in other cities, but risks in hiring a professional and risks in having a regular ongoing person. 
You guys have to decide what degree and level of risk you are comfortable with and go for it. And when you're in a relationship, both people have to sign off on the risk, particularly when one is economically dependent on the other and the risks being taken threaten their mutual livelihood or financial security. You have to be comfortable with the method he is taking to get to X. Right now you're not, and that's a conversation you need to have with him. That said, caller, you're going to have to reconcile yourself to some degree of risk, to him taking some risks for this because there ain't no risk-free route to what he wants and what you want him to have. Hi, Dan and the Savvy At-Risk Youth. Um, I'm a cis female, 20-something, living in a mid-Atlantic city, and I just had a question about etiquette um, with a trans person in my workplace. So I recently started a new position and this uh, guy that I work with has been really friendly and really nice, and we've been talking a lot. And I have a good sense of reading people. I can generally tell, you know, what their age is and sort of where they're from. And I was able to figure out pretty quickly within a few days that he was, um, a, you know, a trans uh, man. And today when we were talking, he finally said it out loud that he is trans in sort of a passing conversation. And in that situation, I wasn't sure if it would be disrespectful to say, oh, yeah, I know, because I feel like that would undermine his, you know, that the fact that he's passing and living his life as a man, um, which he is. And I think everyone else knows him as a man very obviously. But I also didn't think that saying like, oh, really, was an appropriate response. So in this kind of situation, is there a protocol for sort of acknowledging that someone has said to you that they are trans and that you are okay with it and it's not going to affect your relationship at all. Um, and I just really wanted to know sort of what the polite thing to do in that situation might be. You seem less interested in acknowledging that he's trans and letting him know that you're okay with it. than you are in communicating to him that he didn't fool you. That's, that's where you lead with you're open with like, wasn't fooling me. How can I tell him that I knew all along? I already knew you don't have to say that it's fine that you have, trans dar or whatever you want to call it or everything dar because you can perceive everything about everyone everywhere but you don't have to rub his nose in it because indeed some trans people want to be out and feel safe being out about being trans some don't some are invested in passing others aren't and you can't know this is something you can't know in advance where he falls on those issues so you pointing not at your acceptance of him but your powers of perception over him is a little fucked up and misplaced. All you have to say when someone comes out to you as anything or comes out to you as trans in a circumstance like this is, I'm really glad that you felt you could share that with me. Period. The end. And you can add on, I'm an ally and a supporter. Period. The end. You don't then have to add, and I knew all along, I could tell. That's just assholery. I don't think it's intentional assholery. You sound like a really nice person. I don't want to come down on you too hard. But there's no way that if you rolled that out in that moment, it would not be perceived as self-involved assholery. So bury that. It's wonderful that you have everything dar and trans dar included came bundled with your everything dar, but you don't have to broadcast that to everyone. Hey, Dan. 42, married 20 plus years, straight guy, more or less have a good sex life. Nothing has really changed in terms of that so much as I've been forced to change my lifestyle to give up booze. I have to admit, I probably had a problem with it, okay? And here's where the issue lies. So for years, I've really enjoyed having a few drinks, getting buzzed, and having rather aggressive, kinky sex. It helps, you know, delay ejaculation. It helps relax everybody, um, get a little bit more chaotic. Unfortunately, I work for a company that tests for marijuana. Yes, they do test. I actually know, have coworkers. Can't drink, um, but still want to get a little wild and crazy. Yes, I've looked at Michigan pot laws. Unfortunately, I don't have, I don't really have a qualifying condition. Um, any ideas on how to take the edge off? Mind-altering substances that I can... I, at this point, I don't know. I'm a little frustrated because I used to live for that kind of drinking. I want to jokingly say, hey, they're testing for pot at work and you want to get 
buzzed and fuck around, try math. But I don't want to say that because you shouldn't try math and no one should try math. But that joke popping into my head, even though I'd rolled it out in a very unfunny way, it was a joke when I thought of it, reminds me of a friend uh, from about 12, 15 years ago, this guy I knew, and I, I still know we're buddies, who had a serious meth problem and had tons of basically crazy off the wall, but mostly vanilla gay sex on meth, just tons of it. And he really missed the intensity after the meth was out of his life. And he rediscovered that intensity and incorporated it into his sex life through a really kind of off the wall exercise program. I don't know if you've heard of it. The people who are into it are really shy about talking about it. You really have to drag it out of them. It's called CrossFit. And he found that sex after CrossFit, sex in the wake of a CrossFit high, physical high, all those endorphins pulsing through his body, got him there. Sort of returned sex to that intense place. It was a little like having sex fucked up. So you might want to look into CrossFit. You also might want to look into getting your resume out there. You might want to look into getting a job and a similar company or transferring within your own company to Colorado or Oregon or Washington State or Alaska to one of the states that have legalized recreational marijuana so that you can have your pot and your intense fucked up sex too. I am, however, and I want to get this on the record before I go on to the next call, opposed to chaos when it comes to rough sex and substances. Rough sex, people throwing each other around, people doing physically taxing or potentially dangerous or harmful things, you kind of need to have your wits about you. You kind of need to be focused. You kind of need to not be fucked up. Or the person in charge or someone in the room needs to not be fucked up and looking out for everyone. So... Just wanted to throw that out there. You said one of the things you enjoyed about fucked up rough sex was the chaos. And I'm glad you got through it, all that fucked up rough sex, chaotic, unscathed. But I do not recommend fucked up, substance abuse rough, chaotic sex as a general rule. Just like us here at the Lovecast, Adam and Eve want you to have a fun, healthy sex life. And they are very set up to help you get there. They are now offering 50% off almost any item. Choose a new adult toy, lube, or almost anything from over 18,000 adult products. Plus, Adam and Eve will let you pick three free adult DVDs with your order. Choose from all kinds of genres for both gay and straight folks. And you'll receive a free mystery gift. What could it be? And free shipping. That's adamandeve.com and enter Savage at checkout. Hi, I have a quick etiquette question. What is the proper etiquette if you see somebody in public who has recently stood you up for a date. So uh, scenario one, you see the person, they don't see you. Do you approach them and make them feel as horrible as they made you feel? Or do you ignore them like they ignored you? Uh, scenario number two slash B, um, what if you both see each other? What, if anything, do you quote unquote Oh, that person, uh, what would you do in either one of those situations? Slash, what have you done? So many slashes and subclauses in this question. I don't know how to organize my answer. I think the best thing to do in circumstances like that is to be the bigger person. And I think that means being cordial and friendly ish, but distant. If you lock eyes, you smile and you nod, just acknowledge their existence. You don't have to then go and unpack the wrong that they'd done you. You also have the option to going up to them and saying, hey, how are you? I missed you that night and see what their explanation might be. Sometimes people fuck up. Sometimes people get drunk, fall down, forget something. And then are so embarrassed or inhibited about offering an explanation for why they missed that date that they never say anything. And then we read the worst into it, that it was an intentional snub. And sometimes it's an unintentional thing and it just, a, they fucked up. And they didn't know how to say so and they didn't know how to apologize. So you may find yourself getting an apology if you just walk up to somebody and say, hey, that was weird. That night you didn't show up, left me hanging, and then see what they say. That's what I would do, and that is what I have done. Club W is the super convenient way to get delicious wine into your house. Club W is a revolutionary new wine club that sends you wine directly to your door, saving you all those trips to the grocery store. Not only does Club W send you wine, they send you wine that you will love drinking. Club W works directly with vineyards to cut out the middlemen, which saves you money. One of their $13 bottles would normally sell retail for over 20 
They even offer a no-risk guarantee that you will love what they send you. And right now, Club W is offering our listeners 20 bucks off your first order when you go to clubw.com slash savage. And it gets even better. Club W will actually pay for your shipping on orders of four bottles or more. So take something off your to-do list. Just go to clubw.com slash savage to get 20 bucks off your first order now. That's clubw.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. I listen to your show religiously, and I love all of the advice that you give, especially for married couples. I have a friend who I have known since I was nine years old, and she is very religious, and her husband of 10 years recently has been having an affair with a woman that he works with. She just found all of the proof that he has been cheating. It has spanned from I love yous to sending pictures of their children. They have four children together. She just had a baby three months ago. And I feel like she is in denial about the depth of his deception and how they will rebuild their marriage. He's not open to counseling. He gets very angry when confronted about the situation and the infidelity And she seems to think that this will all blow over. I'm having a hard time being there for her and listening to her go through all of this, knowing that I want to tell her to fucking leave this bastard, to dump the motherfucker already. And obviously, it's maybe not what she needs to hear, but is there a way that I can give her advice that would comfort her and help her move on? She has been betrayed and hurt and so manipulated into thinking that this might be her fault. And I want to help her put the pieces back together. If this were your friend, what would you tell her? I have to say that, you know, the last thing your friend needs on top of an asshole cheating husband is an angry, badgering friend who insists that she must leave that guy. She's got four kids. One of them's an infant. She may not be in a position to leave him. Denial may be. I agree the place that she knows on some level she has to be right now. It may be the best place for her right now. There are actually studies that I'm not going to look up because we're talking live, but there are studies that show that a lot of happy marriages and content marriages that the the people in them engage in a certain amount of self delusion and and they lie to themselves about who their partners are and pretend their partners are the people they wished they were. And then interact with that fantasy version of their partners and present to the world that fantasy version of their partners. And they come to believe that lie And maybe that's where your friend is going to be. And maybe that's the best place for her. Maybe that's the place she thinks she needs to be for her children. Maybe that's a sacrifice she is willing to make for her children. Because it's easy to tell somebody with four kids, one of them's an infant, to empower herself by leaving her cheating asshole husband. But she's going to impoverish herself, too, in the process. Well, I will say, real quick, if I can, that she is the breadwinner. Um, okay, well, that changes I could, things. I, <laughs> I know I couldn't I couldn't say a lot in the message because I didn't want to over ramble. Um, she is the breadwinner. They are very religious, and he's one of the leaders in their church. And oh I'm my God, uh, so the an hypocrisy I'm just an, rises and rises. It hurts. It hurts deeply. And mm-hmm. I'm an atheist, and not that that matters. We've been friends since we were kids, and that's never been an issue. I'm very respectful of her and what she believes in. Um, it just, it just hurts to see her hurts. not holding him accountable. Okay, well that's, you know? that's not your job. It's true. You're you, right. You're not there to hold her accountable about whether or not she's holding him accountable. And if she wants to give him a pass, you can, as a friend, I think, share your truth with her. You can tell her how you really feel about that and what you think she ought to do. But at a certain point, you have to let her do what she's going to do. And if she has made... Yeah. A judgment that this is what she must do because of her imaginary sky friends or because it's in the best interest of her children. You could support her in that. How long yeah. are you very intimately familiar with their marriage? Are you, do you know this guy? I mean, I do know him, but it's as intimately familiar as you can be with anybody's marriage. Right. Um, but what, what have you witnessed about their marriage besides that? You know, you know that he's touched other women with his dick. What else have you seen? Is he a good father? <laughs> Is he otherwise a good spouse? Do they have a low conflict, friendly, companionable relationship? Or are they like high stress, high conflict at each other's throats? He's cheating. She's miserable. Which is it? 
It's it's the latter. It's um, high conflict. It's always been high conflict. We actually stopped being friends for a bit because uh, there was a time when I was the uh, one of the bridesmaids in her wedding, and they were constantly calling off the wedding oh, as God. it was happening and in the weeks leading up to and it's always been high conflict, but to me, that seemed like it was their dynamic. But then in his mid-20s, he stepped out of their marriage to speak with someone um, that was 19, maybe 18, who was a young woman that worked for him. And that caused some tension because she found out that he, he had been speaking to this other woman. We don't know if anything physical happened. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't, it but did. nobody knows. It did, it did probably did. Go on. And, yeah. And, and the same thing is happening now. And he was sending this woman that he was stepping out with. And I don't disagree that if this is the choice that she needs to make, it's not black and white. It's a big choice. Mm -hmm. But he was sending this woman pictures up until last Saturday of him with his newborn infant baby girl that they'd been trying so hard for of them together cuddling in bed saying I can't wait till you're here cuddling with us I can't wait to go down on you etc cetera, etc cetera, until my friend finally wait a minute he sent a picture of his newborn of him cradling his newborn baby in his arms saying I can't wait to go down on you that was a caption for that picture yes ew yes Okay, yeah. I'm coming around. Ew. I'm coming around to your position on this. <laughs> Quickly, you're you're convincing me that I would leave him if I were her. It was bad. It's bad and it's dirty and it's wrong. Yeah, this is a fucked up situation. Uh, I almost feel like I should get your friend on the phone, uh, but that would probably traumatize her to get a call from a, a lippy faggot with a podcast where we're discussing mm. her business. But <laughs> I almost would like to talk to her about why she's choosing to stay. She must have told you why she's choosing to stay. Because she loves him. People have done it's crazier the, shit for love. People have put up have. And put up with worse for love. Somebody married the Menendez brothers. <laughs> yes, and it's the end all be all for her. You know, she loves him. They are very involved in their church, very involved in their community. And um not that there's a risk, but she probably never listened to your podcast, unfortunately, although I've recommended it. Mm -hmm. Um I, I think that she just feels so stuck and that if she is to step out of their marriage and say that this was too much, that she will be unable to move forward in her life and find love again and to find someone to love her children. And how does she admit this to her parents, to his parents, to their pastor, to how does she the admit, people wait, in wait, their wait. lives? How does she admit that? Her her marriage he the, the marriage fell because he's an asshole. That's not yes. on her. But I'm sure you've said all this to her, and she if she won't take your counsel, if she won't leave him, she won't leave him. You know, I can't give you a magic crowbar for you to pry him apart. But, Just at a certain point, you have to, you know, not endorse the choice she's made, but reconcile yourself to it. Be like, all right, you're staying yeah. with him. Let's talk about House of Cards season four. Let's talk about something else. <laughs> And I think that's something just, that you as a friend and all of us as friends to people with a lot of drama in their lives have a right to do. You know, if somebody goes round and round and round with their drama and they won't take any advice and they won't change anything to de-dramaify their lives, perhaps they have a taste for the drama or they're mm -hmm. just, they want to be miserable or they're okay with being miserable. And at a certain point, we have a right to say, you, this is what you want. This is what you chose. You're, you're not listening to me about it. So I don't want to say, I don't want to talk about it anymore. Let's talk about something yeah. else. And I'm here to help you still be, want to be your friend, still want to be good to you. And you can still come to me with your problems, but you can't come to me with this problem. Because you know the solution to this one and you've rejected it. Yeah. And I think that you are correct. And I think that that's where our conversations have been going in the last week, is that if we're going to keep having the same conversation over and over again, that you need to know that you've heard my piece and this is what's being said. I just, I really want him to be, and I know this is probably not rational. I just want him to be held accountable for the disgusting things that he has done to not only his wife, but to his family. And I agree with you on monogamish and people making mistakes. And that doesn't account for who you are as an entire person. I, I listen to you every week and I agree with you a thousand percent. 
I just think in this situation that he has completely been uh, hurtful and intentionally hurtful and deceptive and has Mm -hmm. gaslighted her. And with all of our conversations, there's nothing that you can, you can say other than that. It's very frustrating. Cheating happens. And there's a difference between, you you know, there are degrees and we have to take them on a case by case basis. This guy sounds like a a regular Josh Duggar. Yeah. And I'm not down with the Josh Duggar. Yeah, I'm not down absolutely. with religious hypocrisy. <laughs> I'm not down with cheating hypocrisy. I'm not down with serial infidelity. I'm not down with that. I'm not down with these kinds of lies and deceits and this kind of inconsideration and cruelty. Not okay. But that doesn't change the fact that your friend is choosing to stay in this marriage for her reasons. You know, if you can say, I don't want to talk about it. You can also say every time she brings it up, you should leave him. Then she goes on and on some more. You should leave him. Mm -hmm. You should leave him. You should leave him. You can just stick to those four words whenever the subject comes up. Still let her (laughs) unload on you, but you can turn your brain off and think about other things and spit those four words out on automatic pilot. Good luck. Thank you. And I... I appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for all the people that you help. You're really amazing. I I ache for your friend. I really do. Me too. And we've all seen, you know, people in our lives who stay with people that we can't quite fathom why they would stay. But what can you do? Other people's relationships and inner lives are mysteries to us. And at a certain point, we have to just accept what we cannot change. It's true. It's like the serenity prayer. But yes, we know that (laughs) we know that this will not (laughs) we know that this will not turn out well. But yeah, I mean, I wish her the best and always be respectful, but she should dump this motherfucker already. By which you mean to say you would dump him already if he were your husband, but he ain't your husband. He's her husband. And there's nothing you can do about it. Thank you so much, Dan. I hope you have a great day. I appreciate your help and calling back. Bye. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Squarespace, the simplest way for anyone to create a beautiful landing page, website, or online store. With easy-to-use tools and templates, Squarespace helps you personalize your site and make it your own. Their sites look professionally designed regardless of skill level, no coding required. The templates make it easy to use, and their customer support is friendly and accessible. Get a free domain if you sign up for a year. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code SAVAGE to get 10% off your first purchase. That's Squarespace, offer code SAVAGE. Hi, Dan. I'm a 27-year-old heterosexual female with quite a quandary. I've been dating this guy for a few weeks, and things were really fun and exciting, and we kind of fell out of communication because we've both been really busy the last few weeks. I was feeling a little frustrated with his communication and naturally Googled him, and the first thing that came up was that he's a registered sex offender. I know this could mean so many different things, so I didn't want to jump to the conclusion that he's a rapist or a child molester. When I did further internet investigation, it turns out that three years ago he was specifically charged for, quote, committing sexual assault by knowingly inflicting sexual intrusion or penetration on a victim if the person causes the victim to submit against the victim's will, end quote. Is this a gray area or is this just a pretty black and white picture? I haven't confronted him about any of this, and I'm not even sure that is a fair or, or, or appropriate thing to do, especially at this time in our relationship. I've been trying to keep things at a distance because I'm naturally freaked out by this information. He reached out to me, expressing that he really wants to spend time together, and I really found this person to be sweet and charming and respectful. I'm conflicted about the information that I know and the person I think I know. What do I do? You can't unknow this, and you are in a position now where for your own protection, you need to say to this guy, I found your name on a sex offender registry, and I read this, and I feel entitled to an explanation what happened? And then you verify that. Trust but verify, like Ronald Reagan said. If he was convicted of a crime, there are public records somewhere. There are court transcripts somewhere. And you should read them, get them, read them, and weigh them against what he told you. And hopefully there won't be a discrepancy between what you found when you did a public records request and what you learned from him when you made a direct request for information. People who commit sex crimes the recidivism rate is actually lower than for people who commit other sorts of crimes. 14% of people who've committed a sex crime reoffend within five years, 24% reoffend within 15 years. 
are those odds you're willing to run for this guy? You say you really like him. Maybe this he learned his lesson. Maybe he got the treatment that he needed. Maybe he did something stupid under the influence that otherwise he would not have done and will never do ever again and doesn't drink anymore and has taken all sorts of steps to prevent himself from harming another woman in the way he harmed that woman. Those are judgment calls you're going to have to make as you decide whether or not you want to continue to see this nice guy who committed a sex crime and went to prison for it and landed on a sex registry because of it. It's a terrible position to be in. You will have to trust your best judgment if you do indeed decide to confront him about it and ask him about it and do your due diligence for your own safety about this. You can also decide, it's a perfectly rational thing, I think, for you to do in a circumstance like this, decide not to see him again because you don't want to take the chance or you don't want to take the risk. Whatever choice you ultimately decide to make, I support. Hey, Dan, you expected the calls to come and here's one of them. I am a bartender and have been for six years. I have never been unfaithful to a partner. Again, to add to that, at the end of a shift, I am way too tired at 3, 4 a.m. to possibly have sex, let alone pursue some drunk, gross person from the bar. Yeah, I'm calling about uh, 498, uh, about uh, guys faking orgasm. I just wanted to say, um, otherwise totally... I guess, normal head guy that I used to do it all the time. I used to fake all the time. And basically I would either, I would fake pound and hope that she wasn't noticing that anything was coming out afterwards, which I think they don't check that much or definitely with the condom thing. And at the very least, sometimes I would fake the muscle cramps or something to just get out of it. And usually it was somebody who, where the relationship was winding down, but I really liked them, but I was losing interest. I knew it was time to pull the plug, but I still liked them and I wanted to try and please them. But I'm sure lots of guys do it because it's pretty easy to fake it. Hey, Dan, 43-year-old straight male. I, listening to your Tuesday after Mother's Day show when you were talking about how gay parents have this discrimination that they have to deal with when they take their kids out, I just wanted to kind of identify and relate. I was a single parent for 14 years. and most, They're good kids. Most of the time there wasn't much, you know, correction or discipline involved. We just hung out. We had a great time. And there were two awesome uh, adults now, pretty much, and they straight A students. They turned out. They turned out all right. But we would get that a lot, where we would get. I mean, every time I go in the grocery anywhere, people would come up to me, and they'd be like, "And the most common one I got was on the weekends, where they'd say, oh, it's Dad weekend with the kids.' You know, so it's kind of a similar similar thing. It's like you know, you're you're dealing with the discrimination in a way, and it's, it's kind of a different kind. You know, I'm not gonna. I don't need any rally to protest about it. It's just you know, an annoyance. I have to deal with it five, six, seven, eight times. We'll be at the playground. People ask us. Be at the grocery. People ask us. So I came up with um, an answer. The best answer for that. You could think about the question. It's really, really rude. What if something had happened to the mom? In our case, she just left. You know, she was gone. You know, it's, and my kids are okay with it. You know, we had a good time. So, so, but you know, still, it's kind of a rude question. Well, where's mommy? You know, well, mommy, mommy could be. You know, our mommy was in Arizona. Like uh, we're in Indiana. She was like what, 3,000 miles away. We never saw her. So, you know, it's not a good thing to be bringing up to people all the time. Maybe they don't want to think about it. So what we did, uh, and I don't suggest that anyone else do this, is we just said, she died. And then the kids would look down and look really, really, really sad. And that was just sort of our way of dealing with insensitive people asking insensitive questions. And we're going to leave it there. 206-302-2064 is the number here at the Savage Lovecast. If you'd like to record a question or a comment for a future show, give us a buzz. 206-302-2064. Follow me on Twitter at FakeDanSavage. Follow Joan Price on Twitter at Joan Price. And follow Jillian Keenan on Twitter at Jillian Keenan. The Savage Lovecast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and the tech savvy at risk youth and Nancy. We will all be back at you next week with another installment of the Savage Lovecast. Thanks for downloading.